Welcome to part two of Sudden Illness. The topics that we'll cover in part two are altered mental status, and these basically will have three subsets. All of these three things lead to altered mental status. Fainting, seizures, and diabetic emergencies. So let's start off by defining what altered mental status is. Altered mental status is a change in a person's normal responsiveness or awareness. And the way that we see these is that a person may be any of these things, confused, disoriented, potentially combative, perhaps drowsy, or even unresponsive. Now remember, a person who's combative and has an altered mental status doesn't really know what they're doing. Your safety is first. Keep yourself safe and then try to keep the victim safe. But in all cases, altered mental status stems from some other illness or injury. Something else is going on. This doesn't happen all by itself. So first let's talk about the uh, least serious of these problems and that's fainting. Fainting is a sudden brief loss of consciousness and usually collapse, but it's usually not serious. Um, we see it in the movies or on television all the time. A person faints. The primary uh, objective that you'd want to have is to potentially help the person to the ground so that they don't fall hard. The reasons why people can faint run the gamut. It can be things like hot weather, like you might have out on a work site, or a person who doesn't eat their breakfast that particular morning, and you have a particularly hard job, a strenuous job to do that morning. Sometimes standing up quickly after sitting or lying down for a long time. I know I have problems when I play catch with my son, and I'm in a catcher's stance for a while, and then if I get up very quickly, I'll have a little head rush, a little dizziness, just for a moment. I've never passed out from it, but sometimes it feels like you certainly could. There is, there, well, there are times when fainting can be potentially serious, and this is especially concerning in pregnant women and those who have other significant medical problems, such as heart problems or diabetes, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. So, usually the very young and the very old shouldn't do anything that should cause us much concern. But when they do, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it quite that way, but the very young and the very old fainting is a cause for concern and potentially calling 911. The primary signs of fainting, other than the fact that the person passes out, is that they'll develop pale, cool skin and might break out into what they would describe as a cold sweat. Now, as far as first aid for fainting is concerned, first off, you want to monitor their breathing. If they pass out, obviously we want to make sure that they remain, they, that they keep breathing. And if they happen to stop breathing, we need to be ready to perform CPR if necessary. So have your pocket mask available to you if you have one or other barrier um, and, and have those ready for, for use. If the person just feels suddenly lightheaded, have them sit down and place their head between their knees. And no, I'm not going to say the rest of the line. Just have them put their head down between their knees. Most people usually recover from sudden dizziness from whatever source in just a few minutes, and they're usually able to go about their lives. If the person does actually pass out, lay the victim flat and raise their legs 6 to 12 inches. Let's get that blood back up in their head. If the person did fall, Make sure to check them for injuries. And as they recover, reassure the victim. Talk to them nicely. Tell them everything's going to be okay. You do need to call 911 if recovery is delayed. A person who's fainted should regain full consciousness within about five minutes or so. If they don't, call 911. And if you do need to call 911 and the person's breathing normally, place them in the recovery position. Next, let's talk about a, a little bit more of a serious condition, and that's seizures. 
The primary cause of seizures in adults is a disease known as epilepsy. It is a brain disorder that causes uncoordinated electrical signals inside the brain that then manifest themselves usually as uncontrollable muscle, muscle motions and altered levels of consciousness or altered mental status. But seizures can also be caused by head injuries, either acutely, right when the head injury occurs, or even after a person has had a head injury. In the military, seizures were common in uh, service members who had had, who had, had suffered closed head injuries in combat. Another cause of seizures can be low blood sugar. High blood sugar can cause them as well, but that's less common. So we talk more about low blood sugar, and we're going to talk about diabetes here in a moment. Some poisons can interfere with the normal neurological status of the brain, the electrical functioning of the brain, and can cause seizures. And finally, I like, well, I'm not, not finally, but electric shock can cause seizures as well, as this overrides the, the brain's normal electrical conduction system and then causes uncontrolled electrical signals inside the brain. And then, finally, in children and infants, especially small children, uh, we're talking toddlers, maybe a little bit older, high fever is the most common cause of seizures in this age group. The most common cause of seizures in epileptics or adults is being non-compliant or not taking their medicines correctly. Even missing one dose of an anti-seizure medication can cause a person to have a seizure. It's very important that they take their medications properly. If a person in your workplace or in your home or wherever you are has a seizure, your primary occupation will be to prevent injuries from the seizure itself. Protect their head. If um, my thought of where I might see a seizure would be a shopping mall food court. So we're talking about a hard floor, lots of chairs and tables around. Clear the area of the person, while at the same time trying to respect some level of privacy. Uh, seizures can be rather embarrassing in public places. So move things that they could hit with their bodies out of the way. If possible, loosen any tight clothing. What I think of here are things like coats and jackets during the winter months. We want to remove or at least loosen any clothing that might restrict their breathing. Check for a medical identification, especially after the seizure is over. Place the person in a recovery position after the seizure is over or even when it is occurring if it's safe to do so. And then as the victim recovers, talk to them and reassure them. And again, as they recover, attempt to have some respect for the victim's privacy. Again, in a public place, these can be a bit embarrassing. Here's a nice graphic from the Epilepsy Foundation about what to do when a person in public is having a seizure. First off, don't put anything into their mouth. Yes, it is possible that they may bite their tongue and they may begin to bleed. But that's the reason why you place them in the recovery position, such as they show this person here. Look for medical identification alert, bracelets or necklaces. Time the seizure with a watch. If it lasts more than five minutes, immediately call 911. Don't try to hold the person down. Uh, all you need to do is just make sure that they don't hit things that might injure them. And again, I'm thinking here of things like the tables at a food court that are bolted to the floor and the person bangs their arm into it. Just try to keep their arm from banging into that. Don't hold the arm still. Just perhaps even pat it or just uh, use a food tray to just make sure that the, the arm doesn't come directly in contact with that, that table leg. It says here, a seizure that lasts more than five minutes deserves a 911 call. Absolutely. If you don't see that the person has any sort of epilepsy or seizure disorder identification, call 911. This may be a first time seizure, and those are impossible to prevent and uh, are definitely medical emergencies. They need to be seen by a physician. 
If a person has a slow recovery, most people who have a seizure will recover after the seizure is over and it's a shaking. Their bodies, their bodies will shake and then stop shaking for a moment and then shake again. These are called tonic-clonic seizures. Um, most people will make a almost full recovery. It's not like they want to go shopping, but they'll make a full recovery within 15 to 20 minutes. And if it goes on any longer than that, then you definitely want to call 911. If the person has a second seizure in front of you, that is an immediate 911 call. This may be leading to a condition known as status epilepticus, and that is a true medical emergency. It can kill the person. If it's a pregnant woman, or if you see that they have some other medical diagnosis, call 911 immediately. Uh, seizures and pregnancies can be signs of a very serious condition known as eclampsia, and both the mother and the baby are at risk. Next, let's talk about diabetes. Diabetes is a disease that interferes with the body's use of sugar, usually by the fact that the pancreas is no longer secreting insulin. Insulin is required for our body's cells to use sugar. It's like the key to the lock on a door. The only cells in our body that don't require uh, insulin to use sugar are our brain cells and our central nervous system. You'll remember um, I mentioned in class that we used to taste fluid leaking from the ears to see if it was sweet and that's because the brain and the spinal cord bathe in a sugary uh, sugary fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, and that uh, those cells can use that sugar directly. There are basically two emergencies you need to think about for diabetes. Those are hypoglycemia. Hypo means low. Glycemia means blood sugar. And then the opposite is hyperglycemia, or high blood sugar. We generally think of hypoglycemia first. It happens rapidly. A person can be, go, can be completely normal and then be having a hypoglycemic crisis within the space of just a few minutes. Whereas hyperglycemia tends to happen over time, usually over the course of several hours. The nice thing about it is, for first aiders, is that we treat it exactly the same way, be it hypo or hyperglycemia. Remember, as a first aider, you're not going to be able to measure their blood sugar uh, with a glucometer or a little those little machines you see advertised on television. So luckily, we treat both the same. We'll talk about that here in a moment. As far as signs of a person experiencing a diabetic emergency, we can think of sudden dizziness, shaking, or a mood change. The person suddenly becomes grumpy. Headache, confusion, loss of concentration. They're just not able to do a simple task, perhaps. Some folks will have pale skin. Other folks may complain of being hungry or thirsty. Uh, some may have problems walking. You might remember that from part one, that that was a sign for stroke. Sometimes diabetics uh, look like they're having strokes. The usual, uh, the way that we can tell the difference is because their entire bodies will be weak or clumsy, clumsy not just one side. And then finally, if the condition becomes very serious, you may see seizure, just like we've already talked about. As far as what you need to do for these guys, if you see a, di a potential diabetic emergency, first off, confirm that uh, diabetes is in the victim's history. Again, look for a medical alert bracelet or, or necklace. No matter if they have high or low blood sugar, if they have an an altered mental status and have a history of diabetes, give the victim sugar by mouth as long as the victim can speak and hold their own head up. Remember, we're introducing a substance to the airway, so if they can't speak or hold their head up, then we might actually put something in their airway that might block it. And of course, that's very dangerous. Now, some folks will say, well, wait a second, if they have high blood sugar, why are we giving them more? Well, if they have high blood sugar that's actually giving them symptoms, what we can give them by mouth will be a drop in the bucket of their problem. 
their blood sugars will usually be so high that we might bump that blood sugar up two points when their blood sugar is already 300. So it really doesn't make that much of a difference. But if they have low blood sugar, let's say their blood sugar is 20, and we give them sugar, we can bump it up to 110 very quickly. So it really doesn't hurt the person who has high blood sugar, and it can save the life of a person who has low blood sugar. And finally, you need to call 911 if the victim becomes unresponsive or if the system's symptoms persist, even after you give them some sugar. Well, that's the end of part two of sudden illness. If you have any questions, make sure to bring them up in class. Thanks for your attention.